as I open uh, the second epistle of John, um, I'm a person who loves to explore and desire, but that in my lifetime, I will have the privilege of being able to complete the whole Bible, at least in preaching. Um, and uh, that desire had been planted in my heart um, as I was exposed to this wondrous uh, and a blessed uh, approach to sequentially study the scripture for myself and more importantly as a church as well that we would have this passionate desire for biblical exposition meaning that we would submit to the primary um, preaching of God's word which would be an exposition of the scripture in the way that it is exposition of scripture is not something that we just take a word or a, a statement of God's word and go on preaching about it yes that's a word study that's a uh, that's there in the church but more importantly my heart's desire has been that we as a church as a main course as a good diet of God's word would long to study the scripture and submit our hearing of God's word, our preaching of God's word to the structure and the emphasis of the text in the sense that as God had put his text, uh, God, the Holy Spirit, has a supreme agenda and plan and purpose in blessing our lives in the way he put the scripture together. And uh, my desire is that as we just let the scripture uh, open itself up in the beautiful way it has been put together there is such light such liberty and such life that we can receive that our lives are going to be confirmed to the thoughts to the plans and to the purposes of God more and more as days go by so with that quest um, I look up to some portions of scripture that we have never come to and I'm sure in the history of our church so far we have not so focusedly come to this epistle of second letter of John. Interestingly this is the shortest epistle uh, and it is no way the least important one. Equally important in how God had preserved it in his word and uh, many a times uh, we've looked at Philemon which is the shortest of Apostle Paul. Puzzle Paul can't be short. Uh, he is a short man, as the history says, but he can never be short in what he writes. He can go on and on sometimes, writing a number of verses in one statement that he is writing to. And uh, the shortest of Apostle Paul is Philemon, and the shortest uh, of John, and of course, the whole of New Testament is this 13 verse letter that uh, John had written. By the way, um, this epistle of John is an important one. As I said, don't take it light when we see a little epistle. I would always say when somebody says little, when somebody says just few words, those words are much weightier. If somebody is dying on, the, on their deathbed, their words are very, sh very small but they are much weight in what they want to do in the short time that they have. And so is this epistle, I would say, that it has such important uh, um, applications for our lives, such important exhortations for our life or encouragement that is so required, especially in these last days. Now, having said that, when I looked at the main emanating theme of this letter, it is a resounding encouragement that John the Apostle is giving that we should be walking in truth and in love. This might sound so simple and plain, um, unlike what we have read so many verses, but I would want us to let us expose ourselves to what this epistle has. A few introductory comments, we'll come back to this theme but uh, a few introductory comments 
that we would see this whole book, uh, this letter, sorry, is, uh, as I have titled, it is Walking in Truth and Love. And Telugu lo, Satya Premal Endu Nadu Chuta, Anchepi, Manam Gnyap Kampet Kundam. Aite, next slide kvelte, we would see the, there are four divisions of this particular letter. Nalugu Bhagam Laga Manamu E. Ipatrikanu Manam Vibhaginch Koch. Matamadati, it is introduction and opening greetings in verses 1 to 3. John is giving us introduction and opening greetings. Let's go to the next slide, which gives us the reading of this particular portion. Uh, and uh, here only w one and two verses are given. But as we look at this introduction, we see the letter has been written by the elder. Uh, by the way, the elder, as we see, um, and uh, as we see the theme uh, as the as an emanating theme of First John and Second John, we would see that we can certainly deduct to be that it is John. Here in this letter itself, he is not obviously, explicitly saying, "I, John, am writing to so and so." He is saying a generic title is being given to himself as the author. And uh, by the way, when we look at a little of historical background, we see that there is another John in the same church of Ephesus uh, who was overseeing the churches in Ephesus uh, around Asia Minor. And uh, it, it seems that uh, lately every, um, every text is being brought into such criticism that nothing is taken in face value and uh, everything is said is always doubted. Uh, but I don't want to take that route. I can simply prove that this letter has the same theme as we see in John chapter 1, at least in one statement at least, we would see that it has a c complete correlation to the first letter. In John chapter, uh, sorry, first chapter, the second John, verse um, 7 we read, for many deceivers have entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Here is a, a, here is a statement that is being similar to what the first epistle also correlates. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 we read, Beloved, believe not every spirit. But try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into this world. And in verse 2, we read a similar statement. Hereby we know ye that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, is of God. Here is the same resounding statement. There is a, uh, there is a false teaching that had spread out like a fire, among the early church in the time of 90 AD where there is a belief called emanating from this Gnostic belief called Jesus had not come in flesh and that salvation can be obtained by knowing some information spiritually. This word Gnosticism comes from Gnostic which is to know. If you can know spiritually some information that somebody else in this world doesn't know, you are above them and are saved. And it is more of spiritual, intellectual knowing rather than the true personal knowing of Jesus Christ who came in flesh. And so for them, these Gnostics don't require Jesus to come in flesh. These Gnostics doesn't require Jesus to be a real man in that human being who would atone for the sins of this world. They just need knowledge to bring them to salvation. Unlike in, John, in Acts chapter 4 verse 12 we read, salvation is found in no other name except in the name of Jesus Christ who came in flesh as the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and that Word became flesh. And so John was after this heretic uh, teaching that was prevalent because of these false teachers who were going around and teaching 
in the Gnosticism that was spreading like a rapid fire and he writes to caution every, every church, the local churches that are around to be aware of these false teachers and this false teaching. And so that actually brings us, we don't have to go about to the questioning spirit of this world, at least in these last days, to question if this is another John or John the Apostle, but we can certainly see that he is the elder as, as uh, John is recognizing. By the way, not just John, even Peter recognizes himself as the elder in 1 Peter chapter 5. We read, the elders which among you I exhort, and he says, um, uh, who am I also an elder? Peter also has this similar way of addressing himself. Thoti peddanu, anchepi, peddanaina nenu, ani peddalaina miku, irakanga, protsanto raichunanani, peturkoda, abhagan rasinatkim and chustam. So, the thing that we recognize here is the elder, and I would agree with uh, those that would say it is John, but whoever it is, we can say it is the elder. Now, the question also comes to who the elect lady is. By the way, there are also many things historically that uh, scholars have come about to understand. Some say that it is uh, a lady uh, who had a Christian home with the children, uh, as in literal sense, that is very likely true. But when we go a little further into the Greek uh, terminology, we also see that there is this, uh, the, the way the Greek words have been used is very interesting. It is the elect, the word elect is ekliktos, ekliktos is the word elect. And the second word is lady is the use, usage of the word, the Greek word is called kyria, kyria. And when we look at this, um, we come down to verse 13 as well where the children of thy elect sister greet thee. Even 13 had this Greek word called Kyria. And when we look at those two, we come to see that this could not just be a, a lady with, who has a Christian home, who is renowned, who is respected, who is elect, with children who, who are being recognized here, but it could be a local church that this elder is concerned and he is writing. But though we have no explicit understanding, we can certainly take that both of them apply. Both a lady who was during that time, who has a children, who, who is a Christian home, uh, which is a Christian home, and also a local church which have a congregation of God's people who are elect. And uh, the church itself is seen as a lady or a, or, a, or a bride preparing for the bridegroom and in that sense both have come. V well, we don't need to go into who it is but certainly it is for us as a local church that we can come to and understand the most important truths that is being preached uh, and uh, that is what we would focus on for the rest of the time. So let me conclude my introductory comments that John is writing to the local church or the lady then who has a Christian home and to us as well as it is preserved in the scripture as a Christian church, as a local church and as a Christian family that you and I are having children, you and I have this immense responsibility of what John is bringing in as an exhortation. Let me move forward. What John recognizes is that whom I love in truth, John the apostle, the elder here is saying, I love in truth and he says that and not only I but all they that have known the truth. There is a knowing of the truth that distinguishes those that are in the falsehood. The one who is the truth is Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And it is this personal knowing of Jesus Christ that distinguishes us from the knowing that the Gnostics have, where they just have some superficial knowledge 
and uh, are not living out the truth. The, dis the difference that we would see, as John would outline later on, is that they have a knowing of the truth that is not, that is not coming out of walking in the truth, which is what we would see as his emphasis. They know the truth, but they do nothing about the truth in their walk, in their talk, they have nothing of its effects of knowing the truth. Unlike that, there is this true knowing which has a drastic effect in their walking and in their talking. That cannot be separated in how the, 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 the true knowing cannot result in walking and, and in talking. And so here we move on to see, for the truth's sake, because in verse 2 we see, there is a high price for all those who come to know the truth that the truth that had come to us is so expensive. We read in the Gospel of John chapter 8 that they that know the truth will be set free. You and I are being, are being enslaved by the father of lies in this world. There is a father of lies to whom you and I belong in this world. John chapter 8 verse 44 talks about this father of lies who is our father and whose enslavement we are under that from the beginning he is the murderer. He has come to not only ensnare us but to kill us and to destroy us. As, as John chapter 10 talks about that there is a, a thief who comes to steal to kill and to destroy. That is what our state is. You and I are under his enslavement and a time will soon come where he's going to kill, he's going to steal us of the life that God had given and destroy us and to kill us. And this truth had come to set us free from that ensnarement as John chapter 8 outlines. I'm just summarizing it for a high level where this truth is so expensive that it brings freedom. It purchased our freedom. And so, for that truth's sake, which dwelleth in us and shall dwell with us forever. That truth is not something that has come and it is gone. It is not something that you know and life is going on in the same way. This truth that is Jesus Christ, once He comes, He indwells us and He remains with us forever. And that's why it begins to trickle down into our walk. It begins to trickle down into our talk. It begins to trickle down into the love that comes. And uh, we would see that he continues on the same note in the introductory comments, verse 3, Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from, Jesus, from, from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. This grace that had come to you, this mercy that you have received, this peace that you have received is from that same God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ from whom this truth and love proceeds and that He has called us in truth and love. Now, with those few introductory comments, we'll move on to the second, um, we'll move on to the second part where we see, the, can we go to the next slides, uh, please? That this verses 4 to 6 is a word of exhortation. The next slide, please. Uh, previous slide, yeah. As I bring up this title, the first one is introductor, introduction and the opening comments. The second part from verses 4 to 6 is the sign of godliness, which is a devotion to walk in truth and love. The long uh, title for a short uh, paragraph, but I would want us to really see, in contrast with what the rest of the portion that we would look, this is a clear sign that a child of God would be pursuing in. In a simplest way, I would uh, call this as pursuing godliness. A child of God who has come to know Jesus Christ in a real sense, in a true way, would not be satisfied in all that he has known and live only in one of these. 
but will pursue after godliness towards the fullness that Jesus Christ is. When we look at the Lord, our Lord, in the way that Jesus came into this world, Yesu Prabhu and Ibuloka and Kochina Pudanta, the way he came is that he has come in the fullness of grace and truth. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, in verse 14 and 15, we read, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory and the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Or in other words, this grace that we see, although it's a little more, it's a uh, grace somebody defined as God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace can also be understood as reasonless love. He who is rich had become poor so that we who are poor can be made rich. That's the reasonless love as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, the definition of grace. Grace is reasonless love. And Jesus had come with the fullness of grace and truth. Jesus had not compromised one for the other. When Jesus had come into this world, unlike those of the rabbis, the distinction that he had, he, he had spoken with authority. Primarily because he is the personification of the truth. He is the truth himself. And yet, he has not compromised in any aspect of the truth in the love that he had shown. He was full of love. In fact, in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, we see that God had demonstrated his love this way, it seems. Devudu tana premanu manaki, aite devudu mana yadala tana premanu veladi parichu chunnadu, etla naga manam inkunu papulama yundagane, kristu manakaruku, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If Christ, if Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth, in other words, if Jesus Christ is full of walking in love and truth that he walked in this world, you and I who are Christians, you and I who are followers of Christ, how can you and I not walk to that fullness that is into Christ, in Christ, that is the fullness of truth and love. You and I have received this truth that has set us free. You and I have received this love whereby you have become a child of God. God in his love had, had drawn us and uh, he has poured out, um, he has shown, he has demonstrated his love and he poured his love in that same Romans chapter 5 Verse 5 we read, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. God has not just demonstrated His love, but He poured His love on, into us. He poured His love into us. It is that love that should be constraining a Christian to walk and to follow Jesus Christ. If you and I are walking Christian life in your own strength, wanting to do the commandments because you want to prove to God that you are somebody or you are a good person, you would utterly fail. Christian, Christian walk cannot be lived out in human strength, cannot be lived out in human ability. It is impossible. And that's why God has to pour His love into us that by His love, you and I be constrained to live for Him. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. This is this constraining love that will be at work in every Christian. A Christian will have this constraining love whereby he and I will walk in the same footstep of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, the Father's love, was constraining our Lord to walk in this world the way He walked. And Christ's love will constrain us to walk and to live for him and not for ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, we read, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we are all dead. And 
verse 15, I'm going to read only the second part. It says that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. If you are wanting to live for Christ, and if it is not the constraining love, you will be disappointed that I am not able to live a, like a Christian. And the reason you will be disappointed is you are not designed to live Christian life in your strength. And that's why God has demonstrated His love, God has poured His love into us. And in that pouring of His love, and in that reading of that Christ love that has been given to us, you and I are compelled, are constrained to walk. Now come back to second epistle of John in verse 4 onwards. John is now bringing us to the foremost of the exhortation or the encouragement. That is pursuing godliness. Christian life I would describe is like a cycle. It's like a cycle um, where um, in another way there are these two wheels that are there. There is this front wheel of truth that would be leading us in the following of Jesus Christ. There is this back wheel of love, as we say, most of our cars are, are uh, rear wheel drives, right? They need to be a push from the back. And I would see Christian life as a cycle where the front wheel, which directs us in walking in the ways of Christ, and the back wheel, which is pedaling and giving us the strength, pushing us more forward, is the love of Christ. And you cannot compromise one to the other. Many a times, in the, in the circles of Christianity, you would see that there are these extremes that some would take. In the liberal, liberal Christian circles, you would see that, oh, there is so much of Christ's love that He was going to forgive everything. Oh, I can just live as however I want and not live like Christ. That is one extreme of liberal Christianity. On the other extreme is legal Christianity where there is so much of truth emphasis that you don't have any aspect of God's love constraining. And none of them are true Christian like. There is this perfect balancing. You and I are to pedal with two pedals of truth and love that you and I are going to let our Christian lives move forward. And that's what John is giving us, the circle of Christianity, where he says, you who have known the truth should also love one another. And, and what is love? It is to walk in the commandments. And what is the commandment? The commandment is to love one another. And so there is this circle of truth, love and obedience that keeps going round and round to move us forward in that pursuit of godliness, in that passionate pursuit of Christ-likeness. See, Christ, Christian life is not that once you have become a child of God, once you are a Christian, you are not perfect yet. Meaning, don't think that there is no more correction in our lives. There is no more changing in our lives, in our walk, in our talk, in our day-to-day -day living, in our growing, in our knowing. There is much more of journey ahead. You have not come to the perfect image of Christ yet. And that's why a daily exercising of godliness is required. And that happens by this threefoldness of truth, love and obedience at work, pedaling forward with the power of love and truth Truth coming from God's word, love coming from God's spirit poured out into our hearts. And as you are walking, as you are working out this godliness, there is a Christ-likeness that is formed. Turn with me to Ephesians. I'm just summarizing this 4 to 6 in, uh, in few words. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 onwards, Paul is giving to us a picture of how God had Bless the church with this equipping that he has given to this church. The church 
of the universal church and also the local church represented in every place of each locality. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, in chapter 4 verse 7 he says, grace is, let me read verses 11 onwards, um, and he says, this is the gift of Christ that he has given to the church and in verse 7 and he says in verse 11 and he gave what are the gifts that he has given he gave some apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers why now verse 12 says for the perfecting of the saints that is our edifying continual edifying and then he moves on to say for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ that is you and I in verse 13 he says till we all come in the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that is where our goal is our goal is fullness of Christ together we are being more and more transformed together into Christ likeness and if that is the goal there is a journey ahead and how is it that's going to happen in verse 15 we read but speaking the truth in love take note of that balance there you and I are not going to just speak the truth truth is not enough if you we're going to this camping and we're going to probably have this canopy or uh, canopy or canoeing right where uh, there is this pedals that are there where two people can uh, canoe or uh, even single pedal cano canoes are also there and if you are only pad kayak sorry canoe <laughs> kayaking where if you are going to only kayak with one pedal you will be going in circle and no progress is made You're going to go round and round and round Soon enough you would realize that you need to pedal once this side, pedal once this side. And that's when you make a progress, move forward. If you and I are stuck in our Christian life and not growing up, you need to recognize which side you are pedaling more. Maybe you are just pedaling on the truth side and not pedaling in growing in love. And as you are pedaling on both sides, there is progress made. And that's why Paul says, speaking the truth, not however you like, not just that I'm speaking, oh, I'm just speaking the truth, but you are to speak the truth in love. And so this balance of Christian life is what would make us progress towards Christ-likeness. Moving forward, apart from just speaking the truth, now there is also, as I said, the emphasis so much on love that there is a compromise on the truth. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is this chapter where we see Paul emphasizing on the necessity of love, essentiality of love. Christian life and ministry devoid of love is not Christianity at all. You might have gifts and talents, but without love, you are nothing as the chapter begins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, when we come to this, as, as Paul goes about to expand on, on love, he says, Love suffereth long, and is kind, sorry, verse 6, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Does love compromise on truth? No, not at all. Love, in fact, rejoices in truth. It, no, it never rejoices in iniquity or in falsehood, but it is desiring truth. True love would always embrace truth. True uh, truth uh, pursuing would always be right in love and not outside of love. And so that's what we see as a circle and a cycle that John is giving in the reading of chapter 1 in second epistle of John, chapter, second, uh, chapter 1 verses 4 to 6 we read, let me read verse 6. Uh, I think I'll read from verse 5, second part. Follow me there. As we would see that it is this that we have been discussing as a summary. And I wrote a new command, sorry. Uh, and now I beseech thee, lady, or I beg, or I encourage thee, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which had been from the beginning, 
that we love one another and this is love that we walk after his commandments and this is commandments that ye as ye have heard from the beginning you should walk in it this is the cycle and this pursuit of godliness this clear sign of godliness is a devotion it's a passion to walk in truth and love and uh, unlike this as we go to the next slide we see from verses 7 to 9 that there is another sign there is another sign of ungodliness let's go to the next slide please and we see this clear sign of ungodliness is the denial of truth and why do those that deny the truth deny is what I would I would emphasize and then conclude quickly in uh, verse 7 we read for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh this is a deceiver and an antichrist look to yourself actually let me touch on verse 7 a little here this clear sign of ungodliness is there is a denial of truth in particular the aspect of this truth that Jesus has come not in flesh you know why they would not want Jesus to come in flesh there are multiple reasons that you and I would be able to take and understand very clearly if Jesus had not come in flesh their spiritual knowing is what truly will become salvation these Gnostics who wanted Gnosticism which is knowing some some formula to salvation will become the the way of salvation because Jesus has not come in flesh he has not died for the sins in a physical sense and there is no true atonement and so they have to have some knowledge of some secret formula whereby they can say that salvation is by knowing some secret formula not by knowing the person of Jesus Christ that's one reason the second simple reason that you and I would say is if say many a times we see this in the Christian circles when we see how Jesus lived in this world and how he lived a sinless life and how he was not willing to sin but even willing to die there is this excuse that you and I as Christians would often make oh he is Jesus Christ he is God and that's why he couldn't sin for me I I'm a fallen human being so I can keep or follow I, I can fall prey and so there is this excusing from godliness that you and I can subtly bring from the back door if we deny that Jesus had not come in flesh if Jesus had come in flesh if he lived in this world sinless as a human being the way God designed us to truly be then you and I have no excuse this command that we read by the way we don't see this as a command in uh, first Peter chapter 1 Peter gives a reminder from the Old Testament he says as it is written be ye holy as I am holy many times we think holiness godliness is a suggestion or is an option you, if you can try hard if you can somehow uh, push yourself or if you can if you like why don't you try becoming more godly that's how we as Christians would see sometimes but it's not a suggestion it's not a good idea it's a command in first Peter chapter 1 verse 16 we read because it is written be ye holy as I am holy God had commanded holiness if he has commanded do you think he makes it impossible for us and yet he commands no by that do you do you and I say that uh, it is in our strength we can achieve it no not by any means and that's why you and I are going to passionately pursue Christ that his love would constrain us and his truth would keep us in the freedom that is in Christ that you and I would not give in to this ungodliness that is all around 
by the way when we read second peter chapter 1 verse 4 we read that there is a means that god had given in this life a means to escape the corruption that is in this world in first second peter chapter 1 verse 3 according as his divine power had given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue verse 4 we read whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that ye might be partakers of divine nature divine nature godliness holiness is not about only god having it that you and i can partake in it god had given promises for it god had given the word of god which is full of those promises for life and godliness that you and i can partake divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in this world and you know these truth deniers don't want godliness they would want excuse from godliness which is why the easiest way after even a generation are passed away in the very time of jesus christ we see that there were those that came to say jesus had not come in flesh it's only an imagination there is this theory as well oh this 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 human being who at the time of baptism when jesus was being baptized that he was filled with the holy spirit and he became christ for a time this is this mormon kind of a theory that for a time he had the spirit of god to have him do the ministry but he is just a human being there are these two extremes this arian heresy of jesus being denied as god and there is this gnostic heresy of jesus denied denied of his humanity there is one extreme of de- denying his divinity there is this other extreme of denying his humanity sadly this perfect human god man that he is that he lived out as a model when he lived as a holy life he didn't use his divine power to do so in his own nature he lived out he was vulnerable like you and i are he was tempted do you think satan would try to tempt him if he was not temptable he was temptable he was tempted like you and i and yet he knew no sin and that's why he could be an example for you and i and so as we come to second epistle these truth deniers didn't want jesus to be in flesh as we go to the next slide we see that they denied jesus to be in flesh and in verse 9 we read uh, by the way um, as we come to read in verse 8 look to yourself that who that we lose not those things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward by the way when i read this portion initially i always used to be very careful when uh, these jehova witness people come to our home and knock the door uh, i used to be very careful not even to say hi sometimes if we say hi this verse in verse uh, 10 verse 11 we read if he that biddeth him good god speed is partaker of his evil i mean they are the ones who deny jesus didn't come in flesh oh sorry they are the ones who deny jesus as god right and so i used to go to this extreme of being so careful that i shouldn't even say hi or let them step into my home uh, that's a simple understanding that most of us would have but the truth is these the times when this letter was written is a time when christian evangelist were being received in hospitality by christian by by those who were truly believers believers used to entertain strangers hebrews chapter 13 verse 1 talks about they entertain strangers those that were evangelists who were spreading out the gospel like our lord and the and the apostles and those who were disciples who went about to villages and to the unreached areas to spread the gospel and once they have become believers they entertain strangers and were giving to fellowship and hospitality to let them stay in their home 
And as they were giving hospitality, they were subtly giving in to those false teachers because they were not so well versed with the doctrine of Christ. They were subtly entertaining these false teachers. And to them, John was giving a caution. As we go to the next slide, we see that Mehul, can we go to the next slide? As we go to the next slide, we see there's this call for cautiousness. He says, once we give in to the fellowship of these truth-denying ones, you and I are subtly going to give in to their ungodliness, to their mystical, to their Gnostic teaching, whereby whatever true gospel that has been sowed, there is a, there is a, there is a deviation there is an aberration from the truth that you and I have been brought into. And not that those that are elect would be lost, but that reward for the time when you and I are going to be deviated from the truth, you and I are going to be not bearing fruit for the Lord, not growing in Christ-likeness. God is not going to let His elect be lost, but more importantly, that subtle deviation is going to cause us to lose our reward, which is what we read here in verse 8. Look on to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And so, moving forward in verse 9, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. This doctrine of Christ is what I was mentioning about the divinity and the humanity of Christ. That perfect God-man that he is, who was 100% God and 100% man at the same time because of this union that he is as he, as he wrapped himself in flesh. He didn't lose his divinity. Many a times people would say when he became human being, he gave up all divinity. In uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 6, we come to read about this uh, teaching that sometimes people would give in subtly, where he says, though he being in the form of God, didn't count it robbery, but emptied himself. A man of God talking about those that deny the divinity of Christ upon this earth says, O oh, those who say that Jesus is not divine and had emptied his divinity are emptying their brain, it says. <laughs> he says, and uh, that they're losing their mind because Christ can never be but God, even as he is in the flesh. He only wrapped himself in flesh, covered himself in flesh. And uh, in a time like transfiguration, when he revealed his glory, it as though is that the flesh is unveiled and he himself is being revealed. And so, coming back here, that this doctrine of Christ is precious. It is precious for our godliness. It is precious for our Christ-likeness. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 4, he says, I, I have this labor pains again that Christ might be formed in you. Christu me, Milo, Mari, Milo, Telugu Gutrat Ledu, as we read Galatians 4 19, Paul says, Nak Marala Prasavedan Kaluchunadi and Chepi, Mata Untundi, Christu Sarupamu me and their Padu Varaku, me Vishamai, Marala Naku, Prasavedan Kaluchunadi and Chepi. So, as we pursue Christ likeness, we need to be cautious. We need to receive this call of cautiousness that we don't subtly give in to entertaining those of these false teachers. On the beginning, they might seem proper. They might have a nice loving appearance of godliness. But subtly we see that there is a creeping in of ungodliness. And this doctrine of Christ is subtly is compromised. And so in closing, as we come, verses 10 and 11 is a cautiousness that John is giving a call for us and that we ought not to entertain in fellowship and in our hospitality. Uh, that we need to be mindful of guarding 
and are pursued to godliness. And then in closing, in verses 12 and 13, we read, Having many things to write to you, I would not write with paper ending, but I trust to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. Here in his closing, as we go to the last slide, we come to see that in conclusion and closing greetings, he found it that it, this message of cautiousness, this message of pursuing godliness, this message of preserving from ungodliness is so vital that he can't wait, but he had to send it in writing before. He cannot give even a moment to let that happen in those that he loved, those that he loved in truth. But uh, he writes this and he says, the rest of the things I'm going to come and in face to face I'm going to joyfully communicate. But this one, it is so urgent and necessary that I need to send it out to you. And so he gives this closing greeting. But uh, as I close, I would want us to take note in verse 4 and then partake in the elements that are before us. Verse 4 we read, I rejoiced greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. When we come to recognize that there is such joy, there is this joy that, that is the portion of those that labor, for those that are led into this truth, when they see those that are led walking in the truth. John, the beloved elder, he says, I greatly rejoice, I rejoice greatly as he found these children walking in the truth. He, we read the same statement in say third epistle of John in verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. There is such joy when we see our children, when we see those that, are, that have come to Christ here, walk in this truth, not be giving away in the times of trouble, not be giving away to those uh, that are walking away from the doctrine of Christ. And so in second, uh, first John chapter 2, we come to see, verse 19, that there are those that have not continued, those that have not continued in the doctrine of the truth. And uh, they left it, seems. They left that way. They left that pursuit of godliness. They just thought it is not necessary to continue and that they could be by themselves. And uh, John was cautious and that's why he says that you and I ought not to be deceived by the spirit of deception that is in this world, the false teaching that is there and those that compromise in the doctrine of Christ but that we pursue in godliness, that we abide in it, that we continue in it, that we remain in it as we read in First John chapter 2 verse 19 uh, we read, they went out of, from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not doubt, sorry, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. We've come to this portion as well in verses 24 that we should abide, we should continue, we should remain. And that is the portion of a child of God. And... Uh, and this world is, is actually in the hands of the one, as we read in First John chapter 5, verse 17, uh, we come to see First John chapter 5. Sorry, verse 19, we read, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. As you and I are pursuing godliness, you and I would see the wickedness that is around, and 
preserve ourselves in this passionate pursuit of godliness and not give in to ungodliness that would that would be no different from the wickedness that is in this world and as we take note of this we come to recognize that our walk ought to be characterized by walking in truth and love our walk is a continual walk and pursuit towards christ likeness and if there is anything short of it it would be ungodliness and wickedness that is in this world that is soon to be revealed as we preserve ourselves from the corruption that is in this world and uh, when we think about all this you and i recognize that that love that christ had shown to make us not just belong to him but make us like him is so vast i'll close with this verse and then we'll partake in these elements that are before us in uh, in ephesians chapter uh, 3 we come to see that paul was praying paul was praying about this church church at ephesus and he says that that you may know the love of christ in ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 onwards um verse 17 that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and ye may be rooted and grounded in his love in love and may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and depth and the height and when we think about that love that constrains us that vastness of christ love that calvary love that went for your sake and mine to die on that heinous cross that love that pursued after you when you were not just willingly sinning but loving sin when you were loving sin and not loving christ he pursued after you many a times love is seen as if you like you would love but christ love is not like that he has seen that you were unlikable you are abhorring you were wicked and loved wickedness and i was wicked and loved wickedness i was i was hearing to the confessions of august augustine uh, and uh, and one of the things that he confesses as uh, we see is that he loved sin not for the sake of just trying out but he really loved it it seems meaning uh, he talk he talks about the theft that he does uh, of the pears that were in his neighbor's house as a young man and uh, he was reflecting on why he went he had a number of pears in his own house it seems and uh, he still went to his neighbor's house and plucked those pears with his friends and tasted one or two and threw and enjoyed that it seems and you know you and i enjoyed sin like that just like how a pig enjoys this miry clay that it lavishes in that's our heart so a boring is our heart and so unlovable were we yet not just a simple small love but love incomprehensible love as vast without any bounds that christ had loved in that when we were unlovable he loved us to the end in first corinthians first john chapter john chapter 13 verse 1 he loved his disciples and not just when he was living but loved them even unto the end and when you and i think about that love with which he went to the cross of calvary you and i would want to pursue christ likeness in that walk in truth and in love that would distinguish us from the rest of the world and from the rest of the christendom that is heading towards towards this worldliness and uh, pursuing after a christless religiousness that you and i have been privileged to be set apart from you and i have been preserved from may we be preserved and may we 
thank our God for such a love, that pursuing love that He has. He pursues after us even to the end of our life to make us like Him, to have Christ be formed in us and that He be real in our day-to-day -day lives more and more as days go by.